The Great God Pan by Arthur Macken Chapter 1 The Experiment I am glad you came, Clark, very glad indeed. I was not sure you could spare the time. I was able to make arrangements for a few days. Things are not very lively just now. But have you no misgivings, Raymond? Is it absolutely safe? The two men were slowly pacing the terrace in front of Dr. Raymond's house. The sun still hung above the western mountain line, but it shone with a dull red glow that cast no shadows, and all the air was quiet. A sweet breath came from the great wood on the hillside above, and with it, at intervals, the soft murmuring call of the wild doves. Below, in the long, lovely valley, the river wound in and out between the lonely hills, and as the sun hovered and vanished into the west, a faint mist, pure white, began to rise from the hills. Dr. Raymond turned sharply to his friend. Safe? Of course it is. In itself the operation is a perfectly simple one. Any surgeon could do it. And there is no danger at any other stage? None. Absolutely no physical danger whatsoever, I give you my word. You are always timid, Clark, always. But you know my history. I have devoted myself to transcendental medicine for the last twenty years. I have heard myself called quack and charlatan and impostor, but all the while I knew I was on the right path. Five years ago I reached the goal, and since then every day has been a preparation for what we shall do to-night. I should like to believe it is all true. Clark knit his brows and looked doubtfully at Dr. Raymond. Are you perfectly sure, Raymond, that your theory is not a phantasmagoria, a splendid vision, certainly, but a mere vision, after all? Dr. Raymond stopped in his walk and turned sharply. He was a middle-aged man, gaunt and thin, of a pale yellow complexion. But as he answered Clark and faced him, there was a flush on his cheek. Look about you, Clark. You see the mountain, and hill following after hill, as wave on wave. You see the woods and orchard, the fields of ripe corn, and the meadows reaching to the reed beds by the river. You see me standing here beside you and hear my voice. But I tell you that all these things, yes, from that star that has just shone out in the sky to the solid ground beneath our feet, I say that all these are but dreams and shadows, the shadows that hide the real world from our eyes. There is a real world, but it is beyond this glamour and this vision, beyond these chases in Arras, dreams in a career, beyond them all as beyond a veil. I do not know whether any human being has ever lifted that veil, but I do know, Clark, that you and I shall see it lifted this very night from before another's eyes. You may think this all strange nonsense. It may be strange, but it is true, and the ancients knew what lifting the veil means. They called it seeing the god Pan. Clark shivered. The white mist gathering over the river was chilly. It is wonderful indeed, he said. We are standing on the brink of a strange world, Raymond, if what you say is true. I suppose the knife is absolutely necessary? Yes. A slight lesion in the grey matter, that is all. A trifling rearrangement of certain cells. A microscopical alteration that would escape the attention of ninety-nine brain specialists out of a hundred. I don't want to bother you with sharp, Clark. I might give you a mass of technical detail that would sound very imposing, and would leave you as enlightened as you are now. But I suppose you have read, casually, in out-of-the-way corners of your paper, that immense strides have been made recently in the physiology of the brain. I saw a paragraph the other day about Digby's theory and Brown Faber's discoveries. Theories and discoveries! Where they are standing now, I stood fifteen years ago, and I need not tell you that I have not been standing still for the last fifteen years. It will be enough if I say that five years ago I made the discovery that I alluded to when I said that ten years ago I reached the goal. After years of labor, after years of toiling and groping in the dark, after days and nights of disappointments and sometimes of despair, in which I used now and then to tremble and grow cold with the thought that perhaps there were others seeking for what I sought, at last, after so long, a pang of sudden joy thrilled my soul, and I knew the long journey was at an end. By what seemed then, and still seems, a chance, the suggestion of a moment's idle thought followed up upon familiar lines and paths that I had tracked a hundred times already, 
the great truth burst upon me, and I saw, mapped out in lines of sight, a whole world, a sphere unknown, continents and islands, and great oceans in which no ship has sailed, to my belief, since a man first lifted up his eyes and beheld the sun, and the stars of heaven, and the quiet earth beneath. You will think this all high-flown language, Clark, but it is hard to be literal. And yet I do not know whether what I am hinting at cannot be set forth in plain and lonely terms. For instance, this world of ours is pretty well girded now with the telegraph wires and cables. Thought, with something less than the speed of thought, flashes from sunrise to sunset, from north to south, across the floods and the desert places. Suppose that an electrician of today were suddenly to perceive that he and his friends have merely been playing with pebbles and mistaking them for the foundations of the world. Suppose that such a man saw uttermost space lie open before the current, and words of men flash forth to the sun and beyond the sun, into the systems beyond. And the voice of articulate speaking men echo in the waste void that bounds our thought. As analogies go, that is a pretty good analogy of what I have done. You can understand now a little of what I felt as I stood here one evening. It was a summer evening, and the valley looked much as it does now. I stood here, and saw before me the unutterable, the unspeakable gulf that yawns profound between two worlds, the world of matter and the world of spirit. I saw the great empty deep stretched dim before me, and in that instant a bridge of light leapt from the earth to the unknown shore, and the abyss was spanned. You may look in Brown Faber's book, if you like, and you will find that to the present day men of science are unable to account for the presence, or to specify the functions, of a certain group of nerve cells in the brain. That group is, as it were, land to let, a mere waste place for fanciful theories. I am not in the position of Brown Faber and the specialist. I am perfectly instructed as to the possible functions of those nerve centers in the scheme of things. With a touch I can bring them into play. With a touch, I say, I can set free the current. With a touch I can complete the communications between this world of sense and— We shall be able to finish the sentence later on. Yes, the knife is necessary. But think what that knife will effect. It will level utterly the solid wall of sense, and probably for the first time since man was made, a spirit will gaze on a spirit world. Clark, Mary will see the god Pan. But you remember what you wrote to me. Uh, I thought it would be requisite that she— He whispered the rest into the doctor's ear. Not at all, not at all, that is nonsense, I assure you. Indeed, it is better as it is. I am quite certain of that. Consider the matter well, Raymond. It's a great responsibility. Something might go wrong. You would be a miserable man for the rest of your days. No, I think not. Even if the worst happened. As you know, I rescued Mary from the gutter, and from almost certain starvation, when she was a child. I think her life is mine, to use as I see fit. Come, it's getting late. We had better go in. Dr. Raymond led the way into the house, through the hall, and down a long dark passage. He took a key from his pocket and opened a heavy door, and motioned Clark into his laboratory. It had once been a billiard room, and was lighted by a glass dome in the center of the ceiling, whence there still shone a sad gray light on the figure of the doctor as he lit a lamp with a heavy shade, and placed it on a table in the middle of the room. Clark looked about him. Scarcely a foot of wall remained bare. There were shelves all around laden with bottles and phials of all shapes and colors, and at one end stood a little Chippendale bookcase. Raymond pointed to this. "'You see that parchment, Oswald Crolius?' He was one of the first to show me the way, though I don't think he ever found it himself. That is a strange saying of his. In every grain of wheat there lies hidden the soul of a star. There was not much furniture in the laboratory. The table in the center, a stone slab with a drain in one corner, the two armchairs on which Raymond and Clark were sitting, that was all, except an odd-looking chair at the furthest end of the room. Clark looked at it and raised his eyebrows. "'Yes, that is the chair,' said Raymond. "'We may as well place it in position.' He got up and wheeled the chair to the light, and began raising and lowering it, letting down the seat, setting the back at various angles, and adjusting the footrest. It looked comfortable enough, 
and Clark passed his hand over the soft green velvet as the doctor manipulated the levers. Now, Clark, make yourself quite comfortable. I have a couple hours' work before me. I was obliged to leave certain matters to the last. Raymond went to the stone slab, and Clark watched him drearily as he bent over a row of files and lit the flame under the crucible. The doctor had a small hand lamp, shaded as the larger one, on a ledge above his apparatus, and Clark, who sat in the shadows, looked down at the great shadowy room, wondering at the bizarre effects of brilliant light and undefined darkness contrasting with one another. Soon he became conscious of an odd odor, at first the merest suggestion of an odor, in the room, and as it grew more decided he felt surprised that he was not reminded of the chemist's shop or the surgery. Clark found himself idly endeavoring to analyze the sensation, and half-conscious he began to think of a day fifteen years ago that he had spent roaming through the woods and meadows near his own home. It was a burning day at the beginning of August. The heat had dimmed the outlines of all things and all distances with a faint mist, and people who observed the thermometer spoke of an abnormal register, of a temperature that was almost tropical. Strangely, that wonderful hot day of the fifties rose up again in Clark's imagination. The sense of dazzling, all-pervading sunlight seemed to blot out the shadows and the lights of the laboratory, and he felt again the heated air beating in gusts about his face, saw the shimmer rising from the turf, and heard the myriad murmur of the summer. "'I hope the smell doesn't annoy you, Clark. There's nothing unwholesome about it. It may make you a bit sleepy, that's all.' Clark heard the words quite distinctly, and knew that Raymond was speaking to him, but for the life of him he could not rouse himself from his lethargy. He could only think of the lonely walk he had taken fifteen years ago. It was his last look at the fields and woods he had known since he was a child, and now it all stood out in brilliant light as a picture before him. Above all there came to his nostrils the scent of summer, the smell of flowers mingled, and the odor of the woods, of cool shaded places, deep in the green depths, drawn forth by the sun's heat, and the scent of the good earth, lying as it were with arms stretched forth, and smiling lips overpowered all. His fancies made him wander, as he had wandered long ago, from the fields into the wood, tracking a little path between the shining undergrowth of beech trees, and the trickle of water dropping from the limestone rock sounded as a clear melody in the dream. Thoughts began to go astray and to mingle with other thoughts. The beech alley was transformed to a path between ilex trees, and here and there a vine climbed from bough to bough and sent up waving tendrils and drooped with purple grapes, and the sparse gray-green leaves of a wild olive tree stood out against the dark shadows of the ilex. Clark, in the deep folds of dream, was conscious that the path from his father's house had led him into an undiscovered country, and he was wondering at the strangeness of it all, when suddenly, in place of the hum and murmur of the summer, an infinite silence seemed to fall on all things, and the wood was hushed, and for a moment in time he stood face to face there with a presence that was neither man nor beast, neither the living nor the dead, but all things mingled, the form of all things but devoid of all form. And in that moment the sacrament of body and soul was dissolved, and a voice seemed to cry, Let us go hence. And then the darkness of darkness beyond the stars, the darkness of everlasting. When Clark woke up with a start, he saw Raymond pouring a few drops of some oily fluid into a green phial, which he stoppered tightly. "'You must have been dozing,' he said. "'The journey must have tired you out. It is done now. I am going to fetch Mary. I shall be back in ten minutes.' Clark lay back in his chair and wondered. It seemed as if he had but passed from one dream into another. He half expected to see the walls of the laboratory melt and disappear, and to awake in London shuddering at his own sleeping fancies. But at last the door opened, and the doctor returned, and behind him came a girl of about seventeen, dressed all in white. She was so beautiful that Clark did not wonder at what the doctor had written to him. She was blushing now over face and neck and arms, but Raymond seemed unmoved. Mary, he said, the time has come. You are quite free. Are you willing to trust yourself to me entirely? Yes, dear. Do you hear that, Clark? You are my witness. Here is the chair, Mary. It is quite easy. Just sit in it and lean back. Are you ready? Yes, dear, quite ready. Give me a kiss before you begin. The doctor stooped and kissed her mouth kindly enough. Now shut your eyes, he said. 
The girl closed her eyelids, as if she were tired and longed for sleep, and Raymond placed the green phial to her nostrils. Her face grew white, whiter than her dress. She struggled faintly, and then, with the feeling of submission strong within her, crossed her arms upon her breast as a little child about to say her prayers. The bright light of the lamp fell full upon her, and Clark watched changes fleeting over her face as the changes of the hills when the summer clouds float across the sun. And then she lay all white and still, and the doctor turned up one of her eyelids. She was quite unconscious. Raymond pressed hard on one of the levers, and the chair instantly sank back. Clark saw him cutting away a circle, like a tonsure from her hair, and the lamp was moved nearer. Raymond took a small glittering instrument from a little case, and Clark turned away shudderingly. When he looked again, the doctor was binding up the wound he had made. She will awake in five minutes. Raymond was still perfectly cool. There is nothing more to be done. We can only wait. The minutes passed slowly. They could hear a slow, heavy ticking. There was an old clock in the passage. Clark felt sick and faint. His knees shook beneath him. He could hardly stand. Suddenly, as they watched, they heard a long-drawn sigh, and suddenly did the color that had vanished return to the girl's cheeks, and suddenly her eyes opened. Clark quailed before them. They shone with an awful light, looking far away, and a great wonder fell upon her face, and her hands stretched out as if to touch what was invisible. But in an instant the wonder faded, and gave place to the most awful terror. The muscles of her face were hideously convulsed. She shook from head to foot. The soul seemed struggling and shuddering within the house of flesh. It was a horrible sight, and Clark rushed forward as she fell shrieking to the floor. Three days later Raymond took Clark to Mary's bedside. She was lying wide awake, rolling her head from side to side, and grinning vacantly. Yes, said the doctor, still quite cool. It is a great pity. She is a hopeless idiot. However, it could not be helped. And after all, she has seen the great god Pan. <laughs>